Hey, what's up everybody? And hi Josh behind the camera. Hey everyone, we just landed in Bozeman, Montana and we've come in from Florida. They've had some nice snow over the last few days, a bit of a winter storm rolling in and we're about to go and look for winter wolves in Yellowstone National Park. This is going to be an amazing adventure. I can tell you something, it is freezing cold though. I don't know how he's going to handle it to be honest. Crazy adventure. He can see his breath which really scared him as soon as we got off the plane. Looking for one of the most iconic carnivals on planet Earth, the grey wolf. It's going to be really interesting to see how this South African handles the Montana cold. Stay with us, we'll be right back. As humans, we tend to think of ourselves as separate from or above other animals. But we might not be that different from our animal cousins. We've become separated from the natural world, and it's time to reconnect. This is a wild connection. The Great Plains of North America. Before Western settlers, the biodiversity of the savanna was rivaled only by Africa's Serengeti. Giant herds of buffalo one million strong roamed freely. Hundreds of bird species filled the air with song. And the king of the valleys, the gray wolf, brought order to a complex ecosystem. This was a land of magic, a land whose underbelly rumbled with fury, a land described as a region for the damned, where darkness cannot die. But amongst this wild and supernatural wilderness, people have always recognized the unparalleled beauty of this place. And so the largest protected land program in the world was sparked within Yellowstone's caldera. In 1871, Ferdinand Hayden led an expedition into the region he made the wise choice to include an artist, Thomas Moran, and a photographer, William Henry Jackson. The team was quickly convinced this region was a priceless treasure that would become rarer with time. Thanks to the photographs and paintings, the US Congress finally listened and removed the region from public auction. In 1872, President Ulysses S. Grant signed the Act of Dedication Law, officially designating Yellowstone as a national park, giving it federal protection into antiquity. Though the land itself was protected, the wolves weren't so lucky. Thanks to government bounties and a mutual hatred by ranchers and hunters, the last viable wolf pack in Yellowstone was slaughtered in 1926. It would be nearly 70 years before they were seen again. Today, thanks to the tireless work of many, including my good friend and wildlife biologist, Nathan Varley, the wolves are back. With a warm jacket, a spotting scope, and a healthy dose of persistence and patience, almost anyone can now see America's favorite villain, an everlasting legend, the Grey Wolf. It's amazing when I look back that when I was growing up in the park, 
there were no wolves. Uh, there, there were barely any grizzly bears. Grizzly bears were like a mythical creature. But without these top predators really being out there, and, you know, I just thought they're not really here. They're not really part of Yellowstone. My name is Nathan Varley. I'm a wildlife biologist. I grew up in Yellowstone Park, which is a little bit unusual for, for most people, but uh, my father was a, was a fisheries biologist growing up, and uh, I got really interested in, in doing that kind of work, uh, you know, being involved with the natural world. Wolves have always had a certain fascination for me because they were not here initially and what I knew about wolves was from books. So in the early years, there was a lot of excitement around being involved with the wolf recovery and as a wildlife biologist, like, well, this, is, this looks really fun. Maybe I'll get to stick around in Yellowstone and, and, and study wolves. And I recall the mid 90s when wolves were being restored to Yellowstone Park, that a lot of the people that were coming to do that were wolf experts. They really knew a lot about this species and what they were all about, and, and I didn't. But the difference was that I was a Yellowstone expert. I didn't know much about wolves, but I knew where they were coming. And for me to kind of work with these people that knew wolves when I knew the park, it was a great partnership. It was a good combination for sharing our knowledge and predicting, like, how is this grand experiment going to turn out? It's midwinter in Yellowstone National Park and we're on our quest for winter wolves. But there are actually three species of canids, or what we loosely call dogs, living in Yellowstone National Park. The other two species besides wolves are the red fox and the coyote. And right now we're going to look for the smallest of the three, the red fox. And they like to live in these open glades that are found in these valleys in the northern part of Yellowstone National Park. Beneath the snow is a hidden world of activity where pocket gophers and voles are scurrying around in their tunnels underneath the snow, foraging on these grasses. And this is what these red foxes are after. So we're gonna head out here and hopefully have some luck watching the smallest of the three dog species hunting in Yellowstone National Park. Phenomenal hearing and a sensitive nose can detect the slightest activity deep below the surface. It looks like she's onto something. Quiet now. She's got to time her jump perfectly. And success. Although not the largest of meals, this protein-filled package is a welcome source of energy. So as a biologist, I think for me, the fascinating part of wolf restoration is how they affect the, the ecosystem as a whole. How wolves will affect the community now that they're here. And the effects are slowly, gradually subtle, I would say, but over time, they're remarkable. They're, they're very noticeable. And wolves, being so few in number, have this disproportionate effect on the rest of the system. Us biologists would call a keystone species, that they're extraordinarily important to the system, even though they're not very abundant out there. There's not very many of them. But through their activity as a predator, they have a big effect on the prey species, the herbivores. And that trickles down to the rest of the system, such that herbivores eat grasses and shrubs, and even those species of vegetation are seeing effects. They're actually bouncing back. What I think is really interesting is that some of the parts of what I've seen are not exactly predictable. 
what I've seen, for example, are the increase in moose population. Well, why would you see moose increase after wolves come back? Don't they eat moose? Well, not necessarily enough. What they've done really is eat a lot of elk, which were in competition for moose. And that's released the moose from that competition. So we now actually are seeing more moose around in a lot of the areas where there are wolves. Right behind me, resting up in the snow, is a moose calf. And they like to come down and feed in these willow thickets in the riverbeds. We're in the northern part of Yellowstone National Park and we have seen six moose this morning already. And with a population of just a hundred animals, it's quite phenomenal to think that we have seen 6% of the population in the park today. These moose will get really, really big. Just further up is mom, also lying up, just chewing her cud. And we're gonna head off right now to show you just how big these amazing creatures can get. Moose might look goofy, but they are the largest deer species on Earth and the second largest land animal in North America. The bulls are particularly impressive and can weigh over 1,500 pounds and stand six and a half feet tall at the shoulder. Winter can be a bone crushingly cold time to visit Yellowstone. Uh, the temperatures are often uh, sub-zero Fahrenheit, so frigid. Uh, but if you're prepared, you bring the right gear, the right equipment, clothing, then, uh, then it's doable. And, and it's actually can be quite a, a memorable part of the experience. Wolves are active twice a day around dawn and dusk. So it's the twilight times that they like the most. Seven a.m. eerily quiet on this cold winter's morning. We're out with Nathan, the wolf tracker, and we found a whole set of wolf tracks right next to the road here. They're fairly fresh, sometime from last night or this morning. Come and look at the size of these tracks. This is incredible. Look at the size, I mean, that's my hand. And look at the size of that wolf track there. Look at that. We've got a whole set, probably at least a dozen wolves here. Now, if you come with me, I'm gonna show you where they've gone. They've been up along the road here. They've tracked up along this hillside over here. And there's a good chance that these wolves are over on the ridge line behind us here. So we're gonna get the scopes, we're gonna drive this road, pull out, and see if we can get the scopes set up on the, the ridge line up there, and hopefully, hopefully, we're gonna get this pack of wolves. Gotcha. So we're both okay. looking in the same spot. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Um, just where the sun is, then there's the tree, that go, tree line that goes up. Oh, that is gorgeous. So you've got the whole pack just sitting there. The whole pack sitting, kind of getting ready for the morning. You can see one of the wolves sitting up, the rest bedded down, and they kind of surveying their landscape, maybe getting ready to, to move, which is really interesting, seeing that one wolf just kind of watching everything. Right, Nathan? Right, right. It's often one wolf, usually an older one, that gets up and starts walking away, and you find that the rest of the pack just one by one follow along. I've had a lot of great sightings of wolves and I think one of the most fascinating parts of seeing wolves, if you do like me as a guide who's been doing this for years and years, is seeing them do something different. One of the funnest things that we can see is wolves chasing other species. 
it can be a little dramatic because you don't know if they'll catch them and quite often if they catch them they'll kill them. The most dramatic confrontations you'll see with wolves is with the largest prey species in Yellowstone, which is the bison. The American bison can weigh 2,000 pounds. It'd be a real formidable prey species to take down. They generally will stand and fight back. And so for wolves, they have to be very cautious, but at the same time aggressive. Imagine that, difficult situation. But we had a great sighting a couple winters ago where we arrived first thing in the morning to find the wolves had an adult female bison basically cornered. And here were the wolves ready to do what they do. We watched this unfold over a matter of hours. Keep in mind, this, this can sometimes last days. As the bison was trying to persevere, being sort of continually attacked by the wolves, they come in, surround, try to bite her, try not to get kicked or trampled or thrown in the air by this bison. Eventually, you know, they kind of overwhelmed this animal and were able to take her down. So tell me a little bit about the social dynamics of a wolf pack with the alpha male and the alpha female and a lot of people are now calling alpha females matriarchs. There is a hierarchy within the wolf pack and on the male side there's a, there's a definite hierarchy of who's on top and on down and on the female side the same, the same kind of thing and typically the top female and the top male will be bonded. They'll have a pair bond and so they'll be the ones that are mating and not exclusively necessarily, but leaders of the pack, ones that have the pups and all the rest of the pack tends to contribute to raising the pups every year. So they're basically like a family unit, uh, a lot like, like human society, really. I always find it curious that, you know, we have our own domestic dogs as man's best friend and the domestic dog has just been reclassified now as Canis lupus instead of Canis familiaris. Uh, used to be a separate species and now we found that it is actually just a wolf that has been domesticated. And it's amazing that throughout history wolves have kind of lurked on the subconsciousness of humankind, this evil, mysterious, wild being that needs to be exterminated from the landscape and humans have done their very best over the years to get rid of wolves and exterminate them from our lives and we've seen ourselves as, as civilized and the wolf as uncivilized and yet we bond with wolves on a daily basis. We have our dogs man's best friend and we've co-evolved with wolves throughout our lives and it always strikes me that that curious really curious irony that we want to get rid of them and yet they're our best friend at the same time. Living in Montana and loving wolves. I'm kind of a card-carrying wolf lover, uh, but I live in a place where there's, there's two types of people. People that love wolves and people that hate wolves. I've never really found anyone that's like neutral about wolves. I don't, I don't think that exists. <laughs> you either really like them or you really despise them, which in itself is fascinating that they trigger such an emotional response from people. Like many animals, wolves do not respect the boundaries of national parks. And when they wander outside, they face a different kind of human to the one that admires them from inside the borders. 
gone are the rules that protect them. Outside the park, wolves are fair game. Many well-known research wolves have been killed by hunters when they wander outside. And herein lies the irony of our relationship with wolves. While it's obvious that there are two types of wolves, wild wolves and domesticated wolves, it's equally obvious that there are two types of humans. Those that want to protect wolves and those that want to exterminate them. And so when I bring people out to see wolves and they see them for the first time, I don't quite understand what they're expecting, but their impression is, well, they're just like dogs. Yes, they are. They are dogs. <laughs> dogs are wolves. <laughs> and I find that piece really fascinating because wolves are connected to us. And we may not know that until we finally see them for what they are. Seeing those wolves and learning from wolf expert and biologist Nathan Varley has made me see just how connected we really are to wolves and how similar they are to us. They live in these amazing family groups. They are so communicative too. They have this amazing language, just like we do as humans. And they definitely show emotion. There have been cases of wolves when one of their mates dies moving off and mourning or howling endlessly as though they're really mourning the loss of a loved one. And wolves have individual personalities just like us. It just goes to show that, you know, we are so connected to these amazing creatures. We've co-evolved with our dogs and yet we persecute wolves and one has to ask the question why? If anything, seeing wolves here in Yellowstone has made me realize that these are not creatures to be feared or loathed. These are creatures that we need to cherish and safeguard for future generations.